Hi, I'm Ernie Conover. Welcome to my shop. This is the second installment on our hand tool joinery video series on building a shaker candle box. In the first episode, I taught you how to cut the dovetails that are going to hold this box together. And by now you should have yours all ready to go. And by looking at our carpenter's triangles, we can line all these pieces up pretty easily. And we're now ready to glue them all together. Now we could simply put glue on all of these parts and tap it together with a wooden mallet or use some clamps to pull it up. But if we've done our work correctly, we made our pins just a little bit longer than the thickness of the material and the same way with the tails. They're going to hang out outside the box a little bit, what you call the carcass. And we did this purposely because we can then plane the excess away, but if we were to cut it so that this pin or this tail didn't quite go through the other, then you'd be left with having to plane the whole side of the box down to bring that pin up to where it looked level. So it's easier to do it this way, much more assured. A lot of older texts say that you can simply put a dovetail together and let it dry. And that is really a stretch. You'll find that there's enough springiness in the wood with changes in moisture between when you cut it and when you glue it together and so on, that you can't get it to get, go together with a light tight fit without what are called clamping calls. I have some scrap wood here that I cut up to the four and three eighths inch length, which is the height of our box. And I'm going to take our pin board right here and put it down on that piece, right on the edge, like that. And I'm going to take a pencil and just go inside here and trace around each of these pins. It's about the same thing I did when I transferred this information over to this board. There is the pattern of my pins. And if I now put these two together like that, I'm going to take a back saw and I'm going to cut outside of this line right here and cut that off and I'll cut to either side of these. It's a great back saw exercise. It's tempting to try to do all four of these, but I've never had that work out well. And the idea is to cut a little window in here that is a little bigger than your pin so that you can easily put this over the board and use it to clamp the dovetail up tight. All right, I took a pencil and I just scribed a line right across here that was a little below where I marked my tails. And I cut to that line. And I will put it in my tail vise now. In these two end pieces, I can easily get out of here by just getting those right out of there like that. Now, getting these pieces out isn't quite as easy. You can use a scroll saw or a coping saw to get these out. But the easiest way, and why I do this out of solid wood, is I can simply put a chisel right down here, like that. 
give it a little tap on each side. And there we go. And see, I can put this with double sided tape or sometimes I just use a dab of glue, put that down like that, and as you can see, our pins can come completely through the tails, and we can put a clamp on this and bring this right up light tight. So a clamping call is a tremendous asset in clamping up a set of dovetails. All right, I've got some double-side tape out here. And I'm just cutting off small pieces. You don't want to use too much. You just want this thing to stay in place while you clamp it. Easiest way to get this double-sided tape off, i found, with this a little pallet knife here that is very thin, but I can just sort of slide under that and get that off. And these are all ready to go now. And I'll simply take my tail boards looking at the outside. I want this to go on the outside. I'm just going to put these down like that. And you want to put quite a bit of pressure on this. Now that we have our clamping coals in place, it's time to glue up. I've set everything up with the carpenter's triangle pointing in your direction so I can keep track of them during glue up. I'll now just open those like a book. And it's time to put the glue on the pieces. Now, first of all, the glue will only do any good on these plank grain areas or face grain areas of the pins and the tails over here. You can't glue end grain and have any strength to the joint. You can only say one thing that it will eventually fail. So the whole reason for cutting these dovetails in the first place was to create face grain glue areas to interlock and hold this thing together. And they work very well. Been around since Egyptian times at least. So it's a time-honored joint for a good reason. Most people use what we call in this shop cold glue. These are proprietary glues. This is tight bond, which I've used for years. This uh, is their type two. This is their type one. The original is not waterproof, but it's a very strong glue, stronger than the wood itself. Sets in about an hour. You just need clamping for about an hour, um, but you don't want to stress it for at least 12, preferably 24 hours, but it's a strong glue. This is type two, which is waterproof. Uh, you can soak it in water a good long time and it won't come apart. Good for applications where that's a problem, but I mostly just use type one for my furniture because it's not gonna be in a flood, hopefully. And you can wash this glue out of your clothes where you can't wash that out. Now they come with little squirt lids, which are fine, but I usually just put it on a little piece of like a little can or a little piece of wood, I'll put a dab of it and then I pick it up with what's called a solvent brush. You can buy them at woodworking stores and hardware stores by the dozen or even the gross. And this allows you to go in and brush that glue where you need to and you will get a much better glue up. One problem with all of your cold glues is you have to get every trace of that glue off the piece or it will show through the finish. That usually isn't a problem, but for my hand tool work, my finest joinery, I actually use a very traditional glue called hide glue. And you actually make it in a little double boiler. I have a solvent brush in here, and it's a little double boiler. There's water down in here. I keep the glue on a little heater, these are both sold by Lee Valley in Canada. And this allows you to make quite a bit of glue. I can run a class for a whole day on a pot. Hide glue comes in bags or cans. It is a 
brown crystal that you dissolve in water. You mix about equal weights of water and glue, and then it needs to be warmed to 150 degrees. But that warm glue solidifies pretty fast once you put these things together, and it's stronger than it, the wood itself. You notice I've put some paper down on my bench to keep from getting glue on my bench. This is just plain newspaper that I buy in rolls and I keep around for veneering and for gluing. And finishing too, you can put it down and you don't get finish all over your bench. I go in here and also paint some on each of the pin boards. One of the reasons you want to put it on both surfaces is you get better adhesion that way. This is true of any glue. And Secondly, as I mentioned during the cutting phase of this project, this glue is acting as a lubricant so that these pieces will go together as well as they can. It improves the fit considerably. I now, making sure my triangles are right, just bring that up and you can set that in place right there. Take an assembly mallet and hit only the ends of the pins. looking pretty good. Now we need to put some clamps on this. There, that's our finished glue up. We have our triangles all pointed in the correct direction or the same direction, which is towards me now. But glue ups are always kind of scary, Larry. And preparing well for the glue up is always a great idea. This has been a good layout because we got nice flush corners here. We've got good tight fits right in there. If your fit isn't all it can be, taking and painting a little glue in areas like that to fill in any gaps is never a bad idea. All right, we've let our glue dry for pretty to 24 hours now. It's been about 20 probably. And some of your clamping calls will just sort of come off in your hands, but a lot of times with some pressure on that tape and glue from the glue up getting under it, they don't come off as easy. So the easiest way is just put a punch on them like this and give them a pretty good smack. We're now ready to start cleaning this carcass up. And as you can see, per Malice of forethought, all our pins and all our tails protrude up out of this box. And the job is now to level it out. Sanding doesn't do a very good job. You can use a block and really coarse sandpaper and you get somewhere, but the best tool in town is a hand plane. Well, now I'll just take a smoothing plane. You could use a jack. Either plane would be fine for this. Uh, this is a five and a half smoothing. And I'm going to come in here now and put a pretty good hit chamfer on that. And I'll come over to this side. Again, I'm putting a good chamfer on here. And I want to get to where I actually have a chamfer on the tailboards right now. When I put this piece of wood down on the bench, I read the grain that it's rising in this piece of wood right here. So I'll now and 
And because I chamfered this piece, my plane's coming off this end without chipping this end grain out. I'm taking very light shavings with a very sharp plane. Now to do these pins, I'm going to turn the whole thing this way and put it right in my tail vise like this. Now here you got to be a little more careful. I've got to come in this way. And then come over and go this way. And again, putting a chamfer here will let me come off that edge a little bit without doing anything too outrageous. Now I try to work such that my gauge lines are actually left. And I've planed on enough to clean this up, but I haven't gone crazy. And if you work carefully, uh, you can do this. Uh, you look at antique furniture and it looks exactly like this. They cleaned up what they had to and no more. And on these faces, it's just a couple of strokes of the plane like we did when we cleaned up the inside to begin with. So I'll do the remaining side and we'll look at putting the bottom and the top on. With our carpenter's triangles here, this is the top of the box. Although, I must admit this, there's been times when, when I was all through, I turned the box up down, side down and made this the bottom because it wasn't as good here as it was on the other side. So that's an option. And I'm going to do much the same thing. We're bringing this down to it level. And our layout was good enough that just minimally we don't need much to clean this up. want to pick your plane up on the backstroke because it's easy to come back, hit the heel of the plane right here and put a big dent or break a piece of wood out. So you want to work slowly and always pick everything up. Now we'll break all the outside corners. Now I like to break the inside corners as well. For that I use a little bullnose rabbit plane and I can just come along that inside edge like that. I can't get quite to the corner but I can get darn close. Paying attention to green direction. Now I take a little paring chisel and I come right up to the corner. Okay, I've now cleaned up the bottom. I've chamfered all the edges. Everything's nice and clean. And I've taken and cut the bottom to size now. Mine measures just about exactly 11 inches long inside and 3 and 9 sixteenths wide, just a little bit less than that. 
So I first cut it just to a nominal line on line fit in the table saw and then I planed it down till it's actually a little bit loose in there. It'll actually drop right through the box if I keep it square inside. There we go. See, it'll drop right through. So that's kind of what I'm looking for. Make that come right to the bottom. Now, the bottom of the box is going to expand and contract for the rest of its life across the grain, but it won't change along the grain. The size of the box, because it's all long grain of the wood, will not change that way at all. The sides will change a little bit in thickness, but not enough. And this whole thing's small enough we can get away with quite a bit here, and that's what the shakers did. In fact, they just nailed the bottom on here, with no problem at all. And for a box up to about like that, that you can do that. It's not a big deal. Nails are forgiving fastener too. Another way they did it is simply to drive nails through the sides here, and that's the way they made these candle boxes. Got to remember, these were just whole candles. They weren't a big deal. So I've set a set of dividers to about half the thickness of the bottom so I can put a little punch mark where I want to drive my nail. And now I'm taking a little tiny miniature finish nail. Make sure I got the round side of my hammer there. I take an antique device called the nail set, put it right there. Drive it right down out of sight. There, we put two there, two there. Our job's done, that'll hold candles. Now we just have to put the lid on. Our last job is to fit the top. And the top is cut to be a little bit bigger, like 3 16 bigger end to end, and hang out about the same amount in the front. It wants to be flush in the back so that the hinges can work. And this means that there doesn't have to be any handle, that this just hanging out makes it open. So what we're going to do is pick the top side of this piece of wood. I guess I'm going to orient it in this direction. So I'll take a marking gauge set to about 3 eighths of an inch and snap a line around three sides. And I'm going to now set it to an eighth of an inch and do these three sets. I'll dog this in the bench, about like that. And I'll do the ends first. And I'm now just going to take this plane There we go, line to line. And we'll do the same thing over here. There's our lid fitted to the box. While I'm here, I might as well clean up that surface. As you notice, I kept dialing my chip way up to get more material off faster, so I'm dialing it back now. Well, I might as well do the bottom side. 
and I'll now chamfer all the corners. Won't chamfer these two, but I will this one. And a good trick for breaking these kind of corners, awful hard to do with a sharp tool, is to come in with a block of wood that you've glued a piece of sandpaper. This is 180 grit sandpaper and I can just touch that and chamfer that corner. If you don't have little planes, it's a great way to do the inside edges of these boxes too is done. Now for your hinge, you can either use a conventional hinge like this, or you can use what was called a staple hinge, and you can buy reproductions. I'll try to find one online and give you a source for it. But they were simply driven in back here like we drove that finished nail, and they were driven into the lid, and they actually worked pretty well. And that's what the shakers put on all of their boxes. They were cheap. And they were functional. So we've got our box done at this point. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, we'll uh, move over to a Zoom and take questions and answers. Thanks an awful lot for joining me.